Hello everyone, a warm welcome to Stockholm and to the One Planet Forum, uh, where we today in this session, we're going to look at how we inform better and for the future. My name's Helena. I'm the Director General of Consumers International. I'm here with my co-lead, Ulf, uh, from the government of Germany, and we're delighted to welcome you uh, to the discussion today. Because the group has uh, done so much, um, and that's on the basis of thinking about uh, really important guidelines of how we inform, we're going to take the opportunity of showing you a brief video to remind you about those principles and the guidelines of how to inform consumers about sustainability claims. If we can roll the video now. having a few technical hitches there, I apologize for that. A reminder that um, when this group first started out thinking about uh, the way in which we inform consumers, uh, they separated two different uh, principles, the fundamental principles of informing consumers and aspirational principles. Now, these were done in 2017. I do wonder, Ulf, uh, whether our aspiration needs to be updated. The fundamentals were, of course, reliability, relevance, clarity, transparency, accessibility, and on the aspirational side, that it really encompasses the three dimensions of, uh, of ESG, that it thinks about behavioral change and long-term change, that you consider multiple channels, not just uh, expecting folks to look at a QR code, take into account the collaboration that's needed and compa provide comparables to enable consumer choice. Ulf, you were there at the start when these were developed. Yes, and uh, it was an, uh, quite an effort to um, to develop these, um, <coughs> these these guidelines, but uh, they are highly recognized now. With uh, in uh, several resolutions, uh, they are um, embedded, and uh, it's uh, they are recommended uh, also for governments to to put them uh, in 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 place, also on a mere more um, <coughs> reliable and on a, on a more um, yeah uh, requirement based. Uh, but these guidelines are already uh, developed further. In uh, e-commerce is uh, is now the the more and more taking place. So the guidelines um, are uh, developed uh, to uh, be fit for for e-commerce. Each of the principles has been uh, further developed, and each of the principles can now also be applied for communication uh, on e-commerce. E-commerce, the uh, the communication there is, uh, uh, as you all know, is, is quite different from the communication you have in the shops. And so, therefore, we saw the need to, to develop that further, and uh, that's why we did. And they are also available on the website. Brilliant. So um, what's exciting about today is um, as part of the One Planet Network forum ahead of Stockholm Plus 50, um, we've all gathered here to think about the future of the sustainable, consu sustainable consumption and production plan. Um, so how do we bring the SDG 12 really to be the heart of the economic model we need? And in this session, we're digging down and double clicking onto that question about information. Uh, we're going to do a couple of things. How are we doing there for tech? We're going to do a couple of things. Uh, we're going to share with you, of course, at some point, uh, a little bit of uh, a video about the guidelines. We're going to share with you some points uh, which the group now in 2022 feels are incredibly important and relevant as action items for the network and have a discussion about those. We're going to hear from five uh, awesome leaders in the network from around the world. And I believe we'll have a chance to uh, uh, answer questions as well. Um, let me first uh, welcome the panelists. We have Rijit Sengupta, uh, who leads the Center for Responsible Business in India. 
Hello, Rigid. Thank you for joining us. Paul Wallakira. Hi, Thanks, Hi, welcome. Paul Wallakira from the Life Cycle Network in Uganda. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for Thank joining, you. Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you. Louise Widmark leads sustainability efforts for Philips in Europe. Louise. Lovely to see you with us. Thank you. Ana Maria Verano Puche is uh, from the uh, Minambiente in Colombia. Welcome. Hello. Fantastic. And Yu Kyung Hu uh, is a director at Consumers Korea. Welcome. Hello. Nice to meet you. So, as always with this network and frankly with consumer advocacy, we have a fantastic uh, global perspective and a whole range of perspectives from different stakeholder types, from business, uh, from government, from civil society, so that we really make this a uh, collaborative effort and we think what we can bring to the solution from our, our various perspectives. Um, I do want to thank uh, two people who are behind the scenes for this group. Becca Simons is in the room here uh, in Stockholm and Nils is on the screen because he is going to share a little bit more of a preview of some of the key uh, elements and action, calls for action that this group would like to put in from an information perspective to the manifesto from the group that's here in Stockholm. Uh, Nils, would you share a little bit about you know, what the, this group felt was particularly important and why? Yeah, of course, I think uh, we have some slides later as well about the manifesto, but basically for the session today, uh, as we are in one of the parallel sessions on creating uh, a manifesto around uh, 10 steps for transformative action on sustainable consumption and production. And uh, we are, uh, of course, uh, mostly members of the consumer information program or wanting to talk about uh, the inf importance of consumer information in driving sustainable consumption and production. Uh, we have, uh, in preparation, of course, already of the session, uh, discussed some uh, steps together with our MAC, uh, the multi stakeholder advisory committee members. And uh, we would like to dive a little bit deeper into the steps that we proposed uh, in terms of how to drive consumer information forward to make it more uh, concrete and actionable for, for different stakeholder groups, including governments and businesses, of course. And uh, yeah, how then this also can be leveraged uh, by the program. Um, here, you, I don't know if uh, this was something that uh, Helena, you wanted to, to share on the program objectives well, first, as well. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll come back to you. First, I'd love uh, Ulf to give a sense of why this is important and where we are in 2022 with this particular program. Bring us up to speed. Yeah, thank you very much, Helena. And um, um, and thanks to the One Planet Network that we have this uh, the opportunity to, to have this meeting here and in, in before the, um, the Stockholm Plus 50 uh, uh, conference. Uh, why, why do we do consumer information and why was it selected as uh, one of the uh, six programs um, uh, at the World Summit in, in, in Rio. Uh, if you look at the, the consumption uh, at the figures, uh, more than 50% of our greenhouse gases in our country stem from consumption decisions. So, but it's not really addressed um, in politics so far. Uh, but Consumption decisions are based, of course, on information. What kind of information, what kind of sustainability uh, goes with a product, with a service. So these kind of, of things. And uh, that is also reflected, for example, in the Agenda 2030, Goal 12.8 uh, uh, speaks about uh, ensuring sustainability information uh, <coughs> by 2030 in each and every country. So. Um, and there can I just stop you? one thing um, if those on but not speaking <laughs> could possibly mute use their mute yeah. button and Ulf could we just check could you put your mic a little bit closer okay does that work can we just that check better? on sound we're okay. good okay perfect okay we're all set back to you okay so ensuring consumer uh, sustainability information for consumers and then that's why the where the program steps in uh, working on the global level on consumer information issues. The uh, program is uh, promoting credibility of consumer information as well as uh, availability and uh, uh, of sustainability information, accessibility and quality of sustainable <coughs> of uh, sustainability 
uh, information and as well raising awareness for these this information. So it's a, a bunch of issues. Um, the aim is to initiate change not only in consumer behavior but also in business practices and also uh, in uh, government policies. Um, and to support governments in their policies um, there are um, tools and uh, uh, and, and, and other solutions uh, developed in that uh, program. Um, some of the highlights uh, which has been done in the program, I think the first, um, the, the, the start of the program was in 2014, there we had the first MEC meeting. Uh, and uh, since then, a, l a lot of things have been developed. Uh, uh, first and uh, foremost, the um, our flagship, uh, which are the guidelines for providing consumer information and just <coughs> reliable consumer information. Um, it has the most downloads uh, of the One Planet Network of all the deliverables. It has 10 principles. Helena has mentioned that before, training material. And uh, as I said before, it's also fit for e-commerce. But there has been more. Eco-labeling, uh, in particular eco-labeling type one, has in uh, collaboration with the One Planet Net, uh, with the um, Global Eco Labeling <laughs> Network, um, been uh, addressed. Training material has been developed, and uh, uh, the uptake of uh, uh, Type One Eco Labeling uh, has been promoted. Um, and there is a new work uh, which is quite important, uh, which addresses the biodiversity and uh, ecosystem services uh, impacts of our consumption. That has not been addressed before, but it's an, uh, quite an important issue. Uh, we have done two projects already on analyzing what kind of impacts uh, of consumption are there on biodiversity and ecosystem services, and there uh, has been a working group in our program set up uh, which uh, has uh, uh, developed a toolkit um, on the communication of biodiversity impacts of consumption and that was launched uh, earlier uh, this year. The aim is to raise awareness and promote shifts in consumer behavior, business practices and policies in, in that regard and that will <coughs> be an issue which will also be addressed further uh, in, the, um, in the coming two to three years, we are planning another project there and uh, we will uh, try to get even more um, um, more instruments in I involved in, in that. Uh, there have been a lot of knowledge reports um, produced, how can consumers' information contribute to more sustainable consumption and production in key areas like climate change, um, product lifestyle extension, or uh, food systems. Uh, as we look at the development of our of programs, we are now mm, shifting a bit from just uh, raising awareness, um, analyzing to more implementation issues. Guidelines, tools, best practices, solutions, and so on are now developed further and um, with the uh, manifesto, uh, the contribution to the manifesto, which Niels will, um <coughs> will explain in a minute, uh, we, will, we will move forwards. Here you can see um, the um, uh, parts of our biodiversity toolkit, uh, chapter one, the uh, impacts of, uh, of meat on uh, meat consumption on biodiversity, uh, chapter two, um, the uh, uh, also the uh, the impacts or the link to pandemic. Um, chapter three, is it how is it how is the impact of uh, dairy uh, products uh, on biodiversity and how what is the impact of plant based milk? Uh, there a, a sort of uh, um uh, comparison between these two and uh, of course solution-based uh, uh, 
uh, on chapter four, um, um, a vision to how uh, less impactful can be uh, food uh, in the future. With that, I give the oh floor yeah. back Perfect. to you, Helena. Thank you. Thank you for bringing us up to speed on what the network has done to date. Um, and this is where, Nils, I think I go back to you to share what does the group feel uh, are the key action points that need to be brought up uh, in the form of a manifesto or in some form of action plan from Stockholm. And these, remember, are very much from a consumer information standpoint. And then we're going to hear reactions from the panelists and from the audience. So, Nils, do you want to share a little bit about some of the, the key ideas that came up? Yeah, definitely, uh, Helena. Thank you very much. Um, just for the background as well as I think uh, basically from my experience of being working in the program and in the One Planet Network for the past three years, I mean, what I've seen is that we've created a lot of very good tools in the program and in the other programs, of course, as well. Um, and we've also created a very good network, I think, of stakeholders that are engaged in the program. But uh, what has been lacking a little bit, as also Ulf alluded to, is the implementation and how we drive action and uh, make uh, stakeholders commit to actions, I think. So this is a, a bit of a challenge, I think, in the One Planet Network and something we seek to address with this manifesto idea that was um, uh, suggested also by the Secretariat and is one of the elements of within this One Planet Network forum that will, I believe, be a recurring event now every year, ideally, and also uh, leverage the manifesto that we are developing now to to really drive action and make commitments, uh, get commitments from stakeholders. Um, so in terms of the manifesto, I think it's supposed to be 10 steps for transformative action on sustainable consumption and production. So really um, also uh, targeted at different uh, stakeholders, governments, businesses, civil society, but also individuals and youth. Um, so different steps for, for these different actors and um, yeah, again, also a collaborative process together with all the uh, stakeholders in the program, particularly the, the multi-stakeholder advisory committee members of the different programs. Um, and then, yeah, having really the idea is to have simple, concrete and actionable steps, as well as transparency on, and commitment from the stakeholders so that they can be held to account in terms of implementing certain steps that they uh, yeah, find most relevant uh, to drive the work forward. Um, and uh, yeah, in, in the manifesto, we will have three key areas of action basically aligned with the three enabling programs of the One Planet Network, which are sustainable lifestyles and education, uh, public procurement and uh, consumer information program. And the three key areas of action are then the changing how we live, changing how we do business and changing how we inform. And we now have three parallel sessions going on within the forum on these three topics to discuss uh, our inputs on the manifesto. And uh, the manifesto itself will then also be a common, uh, accompanied by a One Planet Handle with Care campaign. So a communications campaign to better engage the individuals and organizations to sign up to the manifesto and the 10 steps and uh, yeah, make commitments to action, uh, some of them through their own work. Um, and then, yeah, as I already alluded to also, there will be some kind of implementation monitoring um, framework within the One Planet Network. And then we will annually review the progress being made uh, regarding the, the manifesto 10 steps. Um, and uh, in our consumer information program, we had some uh, discussions with the co-leads and also the multi-stakeholder advisory committee members on the steps that we find most important uh, in terms of uh, driving consumer information for sustainable consumption and production forward. Um, and uh, we, I, I hope we have the slides up here on, uh, yeah, maybe if you advance the slides, two more steps, then we can see the five steps that we have uh, proposed to the Secretariat in terms of uh, what, what we find most important for consumer information. And that is uh, to um, have national consumption plans and circular economy strategies aligned with the sustainable development goals, that these are adopted and implemented by governments. Uh, second point for governments is policies and regulations to support robust product sustainability information whilst preventing unsubstantiated green claims are enacted and implemented. So here in this particular topic, we already see a lot of movement, for example, from the European Commission, but also other national governments in trying to um, yeah, tackle greenwashing and 
uh, misleading uh, sustainability information on products and services through regulation. Um, so this is something we want to see driven forward and can also support with our resources and the network we have in the program. Um, the third point is for businesses also related to our guidelines here we want consumer information on product sustainability to be accessible credible and effective uh, with businesses applying the 10 principles that we have mentioned already of the guidelines um, in their communications and uh, the, the marketing claims um, the fourth uh, step that we find critical is uh, more sustainable products and services are becoming the norm with com consumers demanding these options and also knowing how to assess the sustainability information so that requires also educational efforts that are mainly led i guess by the sustainable lifestyles and education program but can also be supported by uh, information campaigns or uh, yeah just the, in the product and uh, product related information let's say and other communications. And uh, the final step we find also very critical is uh, to have holistic and globally applicable data sets and methodologies based on life cycle approaches um, and that uh, information is made available to enable station uh, and uh, yeah, making information comparable. I think that's a big barrier that we have right now that this is not the case. So it's very difficult for consumers to compare different sustainability claims, sustainability information, when some of them are on climate, some on biodiversity, but there's not really something holistic or, um, yeah, so there are some ideas, for example, in development around eco scores, but it's uh, not very well developed. Um, so that that's another area where we see a lot of need to work further. And with that, I, I'm happy to hand back to you, Helena, for the discussion with our excellent panel on, on those points. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nils. I think we were having trouble showing the slide with some of those points, but thank you for reading them out, uh, Nils. And we'll repeat them as we go through because it would be great to hear from the panelists which ones they think are, are most critical. Taking a step back, of course, as a consumer advocate, uh, robust information for us as people in the marketplace is crucial. It's one of 11 essential needs uh, that the United Nations even recognizes that we need um, in the marketplace. Uh, those include access, those include um, economic, uh, a recognition of economic risk, protection of vulnerable consumers, redress, representation, uh, education, even from early on, um, promotion of sustainable consumption uh, patterns, protection online, and we've mentioned e-commerce already as much as in traditional markets, um, uh, protection of privacy, etc. So this is in a much broader picture of what we need as people in the marketplace, in a fair, safe and sustainable marketplace. I think the other thing to, to flag is that consumer advocates want to see this transition happen in a way that is fast, fair and accountable. So, you know, we're all behind this, but let's double click and zoom in on this information point, which is where uh, this group brilliantly comes together between the world of consu consumer advocacy and the world of um, uh, sustainability expertise and UNEP. Now, um, the first thing I want to do is perhaps uh, go to the panel and start with a, a general question. I'd love uh, Louise, Rigit, and Yu Kyung to just step back first and say, how would you describe the state of information to consumers today? Um, how do you see this moving ahead? What are the big trends that we should be aware of? Um, those might include e-commerce. They might include the metaverse. Um, you know, uh, there are all sorts of things that we need to be aware of. So just help us understand what's happening. Um, how would you describe the, the state of consumer information today? Louise, could I come to you first? And oh, we can't hear you. Um, can we just check sound once more? Let's see. No, nope, still can't get you. Once more. Is it better now? It is. Do you mind? Do you mind trying without that? Yeah, it's the earphones. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> now, no uh, perfect sound. Thank you, Louise. Please. Very good. Very good. Yes. So just just uh, my reflection on, on on what you just said here. So I think what what I can see from my perspective. So I represent the business. So I'm in a in a company. 
I can see a, quite a fragmented picture when I think about it from a consumer perspective. We have a lot of different information around sustainability on a product level. But as a consumer, it's very difficult to compare and to make a more sustainable choice amongst the variety of goods from different producers because there is really a lack of unity, especially thinking, you know, now specifically about my own industry that I represent, so the consumer electronic goods, um, where you will find one set of um, criteria and communication from one company on a product level and then another set from another company. Uh, what I would wish for for the consumers is that we have a joint way of speaking about sustainability on a product level across the brands within a certain industry so that we can enable consumers to really make a more sustainable choice uh, amongst several brands within the same industry. Also thinking a lot about what we see with e-commerce popping up so heavily, especially after the pandemic. We have several e-commerce partners that are really requesting sustainable information from all of the producers, but they are getting very different input from the different producers. So there is a need for unanimity and, and create some type of, I think Niels, you touched upon it before, an eco passport or, or a set of eco rating criteria for the different industries to be enabled to provide information that consumers can then use to make a sustainable choice across different brands on the product level. Perfect. Thank you, Louise. Could it, Rigid, could I come to you um, speaking from the Center oh. for Responsible Business? What are you seeing in terms of current trends? Where do you think those trends might take us? Things that on the on the sort of radar screen for you? Well, thanks a lot and thanks for inviting us to this uh, great panel. Very good to see some uh, older new friends. Um, I'm going to speak on behalf of uh, what we see here in this part of the world. And therefore, um, I think two points there. One is that uh, you know, what we often say is that consumers is not a monolith. So there are different kinds of consumers and then different consumers at different parts of the world. So in some cases, where what we see is that there is an information overload as far as certain consumer classes are concerned, uh, whereas there are certain other consumers where there is lack of information. So that there, there's a great sort of divide as far as uh, you know, consumers at different uh, levels uh, are concerned. And there is probably some uh, need for creating uniform uniformity as far as uh, accessibility of relevant information is concerned. So that's, uh, so that's one thing which I think uh, you know, is important. Uh, also zooming in, as you said, uh, double clicking, know into the segment where uh, perhaps much more uh, buying decisions are being made including in countries like india uh, israeli the youth uh, and i think that uh, businesses have a great opportunity to start engaging uh, not just me but also you know the organization and there is uh, there is evidence to see say that there's a great opportunity for businesses to start uh, sharing uh, sustainability information with consumers, especially if we take the example, two quick example. Uh, one is the, the hotel, uh, uh, restaurant, cafe segment, which we call in this part of the world, the Horeca segment. And in the Horeca segment, you know, uh, companies in the Horeca segment should, de should definitely uh, sort of find ways to engage with the youth because the youth are, you know, uh, visiting and, and are engaging in that segment. And as, as far as the e-commerce segment is concerned, there's another opportunity for business in the e-commerce segment to also try and rally uh, the housemakers and you know, those, those who are making those decisions at home. So um, these two points, I think I'll, I'll, I'll make at this point of time, Helena. Thanks for the opportunity. Perfect, thank you. Yu Kyung um, from Consumers Korea, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing. How would you describe the state of consumer information? So, um, hello. So I'm speaking um, from a viewpoint of Consumers Korea um, um, and what we see in Korea. So first of all, I think as um, consumer advocates, we've having, we're having a um, trouble trying to understand what exa exactly sustainability means um, for the consumer. So like we need to have a solid definition of what um, sustainability means. Um, so in Korea, for example, like if we talk about like um, sustainability in food products, um, we find some 
eco labels that that have terms of like organic, non antibiotic, non pesticides. And I recognize that all of these terms don't fall squarely into the um, definition of sustainability label. So, um, so sustainability, I understand it, it incorporates other concepts like socioeconomic effects, as well as the environmental aspects. Um, so it's, it's confusing for consumers. And in our own national context, we also find um, different types of green labeling used for different types of food products and also different types of um, non-food products as, as two. So we have different government agencies running different label, lab, eco-label programs. For example, we have the environmental agency running one type of a program and the food and drug agency running a different um, program. And then we have industry, industry dr driven labels, which are all, um, and then we have imported good, goods have different um, international labels that it's difficult for domestic consumers to understand. So, and, and also there, there are some labels that are um, associated mostly with food products and then some for, um, for example, diapers, um, detergent and electronic goods. So it just makes it really difficult for um, consumers to understand. So I, it would be great if we see some sort of like coordination or consistency, hopefully at the international level. Brilliant. Well, not really brilliant, actually. I mean, if, if I look at the guidelines and the fund, one of the fundamental guidelines is that there is transparency, accessibility, reliability, clarity. We're not even meeting the fundamentals from what we can see here. Uh, it's incredibly splintered. Consumers are n confused about what sustainability means and how to look for whatever that is. Uh, the way in which we give that information is fragmented. And of course, that's going to become increasingly splintered um, with multiple additional channels and different uh, institutions and organizations are thinking about this in different ways. So how do we expect the demand side of sustainable consumption and production to actually lean into this and help create a tipping point if in information is so important? So let's look at what we do about that. That's the, the most important piece. Nils shared with us um, a couple of approaches, a couple of very sort of clear things that the, the uh, leaders in this network and outside could do. The first one is about uh, making sure the principles and the guidelines are actually adopted by business. And that would involve making sure that businesses are aware of those and that we go a little bit deeper because it's all very well saying be clear, but what does that mean when we're talking about a specific product in a specific instance? National consumption plans and circular economy strategies, which are adopted and implemented uh, by government, much higher level. But you know, I think consumer advocates in our network would say that only about 30% of countries therein have any sort of sustainable consumption plan. Um, that there are policies and regulations to support robust product sustainability information and enforcement, of course, because it's the enforcement that, that um, becomes important in making the change. ICEPEN, which is a network of 65 regulators that comes together, recently has done sweeps. Uh, they recently uncovered that about 40% of the green claims online were misleading. Um, we need greater uh, enforcement and, and, and understanding of what's going on in the marketplace. That consume now this is a tough one that consumers that we see that consumers demand these options and know how to access them that's something that I think um, is is uh, a step where you need non-state actors you need civil society to come together we need that's a, a complicated one um, but entirely possible and inspired by uh, places which put more effort into education and information and then of course that we build the robust data sets uh, to ensure that there's clear transparency and traceability across value chains for consumers but also the organizations that look at what's happening in the marketplace um, and to support collaboration and connection uh, to reduce scope three uh, emissions. So now I want to come to the panel and sort of I would like everybody to tell me which of these they feel is um, going to be most uh, useful and effective in the next two years or 
if you feel there is something missing from this list, I would love you to, to comment. Um, let's come to uh, those who have not yet spoken. I would love to hear, Paul, from your perspective. Um, share a little bit, sort of, as you reflect on some of these points, um, where do you feel the emphasis needs to be? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I'll start by thanking you for having given me the opportunity to participate in okay. this very important forum. And of course, uh, as you've heard from our federal panelists, I think the issue of uh, sustainability being important, it's no, no one can underscore that. And the challenge that uh, we're having at the moment, even this, this part of the world, say in Uganda or even in Africa in general, consumers are confused when it comes to uh, communication regarding sustainability. You have different schemes using different methodologies. And of course, as Rigid put it, that we have different consumers at different scale. So we have, that means that they will do interpret this uh, information differently. Now, diving into your question, and of course, uh, uh, not underscoring the, 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 uh, the, the other uh, five steps, uh, from my own perspective, I think uh, having consumers demanding more sustainable products and services and having it become as part of their norm, I think is critical in ensuring that uh, we demand and be able to, to, to force businesses to produce sustainable products. Um, of course, consumers, uh, as, 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 as it has been put, that most of the uh, greatest emissions from private co consumption are from consumers. And therefore, they have a very big role to play. Now, if you empower them, if you give them all the information that they can use to take very informed choices, I believe this will compel the industry in ensuring, in ensuring that actually they produce uh, sustainable products. And of course, uh, uh, looking at, uh, say, maybe at this side of the world, our consumers may not be aware actually that they have a big role to play. Because if, if just imagine if, if, if they decided to shun a given product based on the fact that it's, it's, it's not meeting the environmental objectives, I think that is one way of actually uh, um, comparing industry to meet environmental concerns. And the other aspect that I'm actually looking at is also having uh, sustain sustainability information accessible. It should be accessible because it might be there and then you can't access it. It should be credible and effective. And therefore, the guidelines that have been developed, I think they are key in doing this. More so in areas, maybe in countries where sustainability schemes probably are still at a, a low scale. I believe that guidelines, these guidelines have had a bigger consensus at international level, and therefore they can be used at, actually at, at uh, national levels to benchmark with a, with a view of coming up of some schemes that can support the local industry. The other one is the, the policies and regulations that needs to be developed to support robust product sustainability information, at the same time uh, discouraging greenwashing. In this case, we employ all governments to come up with stringent measures that, that actually will punish the industry or companies that actually give unsubstantial claims as far as uh, sustainability is concerned. So in, I look at the three as very important and which can give us, I think, uh, quick wins in a very short time. Thank you. Thank you. And could I ask a follow-up question? In Uganda, is there a particular campaign towards consumers that has been particularly effective in helping create demand or a particular label or approach that you think, ah, that should be scaled up or that's a great best practice? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, in Uganda, it is the Consumer Education Trust. And I think actually you must have worked with the Mr. Henry Ch Chimera, one of the champions here in Uganda that is uh, promoting consumer interests. Uh, yes, we are actually in the LC network that I connect, we work closely with the consumer body in promoting, in actually trying to sensitize our consumers 
uh, and the other way of how we are doing it, we try to inculcate the culture of life sex thinking in the Ugandan society. Um, of course, we have a number of schemes, and at the moment, I'm happy to, to report that uh, at the level at the level of the continent, and that is the African Organization for Standardization, mm. they have come up with the sustainability schemes in different, but basically focusing in the area of, of agriculture. There's one in, in, I think one is in fisheries, there's one in, 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 in tourism, and of course, we are trying to benchmark now with the, the ASO scheme at the moment. And of course, we are, not, we, are, we, are, we are not leaving out the other schemes that are already at the international level. So we are promoting, of course, you, you, I don't mean you can't say that this is the best. What we need to do is having schemes that are, are using the same methodologies that can be benchmarked. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for both providing really great solid examples in, in response to that, um, but also reinforcing this need for harmonization and common standards. Anna Maria, could I come to you um, out of the, the five areas of the manifesto or beyond, which do you think is the, going to be the most important area for us to work on uh, in the next two years and why? Yes, hello. Well, first of all, thank you for having us. Uh, the ministry, we consider the proposed key step number two of the manifesto as the most important. Having more policies and regulations to support robust product sustainability information, that is crucial. It's important to mention that currently as a result of the evolution in environmental sustainability issues, there has been an increase in the interest of different sectors of society to adopt better environmental practices. As a result, in the world today, we have the approach of a transition from a linear to a circular economy, thanks to which our national strategy of circular economy was formulated and successfully implemented in Colombia. Based on this, and adding the global priority of generating a sustainable and resilient post-COVID economic reactivation, we have begun to see the product proliferation with advertisement of some environmental benefits to achieve an advantage position in the market, among other motivations. However, this false advertising can easily mislead the consumer into making a decision that is not very or not at all sustainable. In such manner, we consider that it is of vital importance to promote regulatory initiatives to improve the quality of the information related to environmental attributes of products and services in order to help the consumer to make an informed decision at the time of purchase. Can you give in an turn, example? this will ensure. Sorry, could you give an example of, of that? Could you give an example, Anna Maria, of that type of uh, information? Yes. For example, also first, sustainability information got to be clear, verifiable, and reliable. This will reduce unfair competition due to this misleading advertising. And the most important is to that we could ensure, above all, that the environmental and health rights of consumers are guaranteed. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. And do you, what in, in Colombia are you doing to take the next steps? Sort of what do you see as the biggest win for you in, in the coming two years? Yes. Well, here in Colombia, we are, we have a clear interaction with the key steps proposed with our national government's commitment. Um, currently, we are developing actions aimed at changing these old patterns for ones that contribute to increase the business competi competitiveness and the population well-being through the implementation of a nationwide strategy known as the eco-labeling, which here in Colombia, is, we use the type one eco-label, seeking to enhance the supply and demand of those goods with differentiating environmental attributes. It is granted uh, by a third party certifier who reviews the products or services meet the environmental criteria defining the national standards. 
With this purpose in mind, for the last two years, and on a permanent basis, because this will be a future work as well, the ministry have held learning spaces for technical training with a participation of more than 1,000 people from civil society, academia, and the private and public sector. We will also like to highlight the work being done at regional level with the Environmental Alliance of America, a project that seeks recognition of environmental certification schemes with the participation of Colombia, Mexico, Costa Rica, Paraguay, and Ecuador. Brazil, Peru, Argentina, and Chile have expressed their interest in joining. The progress achieved has enabled us to participate in the project preparation of Greening Supply and Demand, Advancing Ecolabels and Sustainable Public Procurement for Climate Protection and Biodiversity, EcoAdvance. This regional initiative is supported by the UN Environment Program, the European Nation, and more recently, by the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature, Conservation, and Nuclear Safety of Germany. Finally, with the key step number two proposed, progress was made with the regulatory impact analysis, the result of which allows us to identify the best alternative to regulate the environmental features of the products and services on the market. It is important to mention that in Colombia, there are many products with the sustainable label, just as our colleague from Korea mentioned. There are many products uh, saying that they, are, they have, that they share the common attribute as green, organic, biodegradable, natural, ecological. Consequently, we have identified the need to strengthen the advertising regulations. Although the advertising of environmental attributes are based on the consumer status, the advertising regulations must guarantee consumer access to adequate sustainability information that allows them to make informed choices and protect themselves from health and environmental risks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Maria. Um, one of the, the conversations, uh, it's interesting hearing you talk about the link between Latin America and Europe. Um, do you see increased levels of international collaboration on this topic and where and how? So you mentioned that a number of Is countries, a number of countries in Latin America are, are starting to work together. Some are expressing their interest. You've got some connections into Europe. When do we get a sort of harmonized uh, uh, global perspective on this? How do we accelerate international collaboration uh, so that consumers uh, have a harmonized and, and clear view of the products they buy from global companies? Yeah, as the panel mentioned before, it is absolutely important, essential, the collaboration between countries, regional and global collaboration. That's why, yes, I, I mentioned the Environmental Alliance of America, because it's Latin American and Caribbean working together. That's, that's, the, that's the goal, that's the approach. Um, okay. This project also has the recognition, yes, as I said, of the, the UN and the European Union, because as our panelists have mentioned, sorry that I insist, it is very important that the co-labeling and the sustainability information reach the consumer as one as a solid solidify concept absolutely and clear I, yeah. to be yeah. yeah, I suppose I, my interest is how we speed that up, because I think there's a lot of um, commentary about collaboration and international uh, efforts, but perhaps we need to see this even faster. Let's look to the audience for a couple of questions and online, um, and then come back to the panel. Uh, we have Jorge in the room from the uh, One Planet Network, uh, new in leadership, of course, Fabienne, we have Bjorn, we have others here. Any questions for the, uh, the panel at this stage? Oh, hey. We're bringing the microphone to you. Um, 
No, absolutely inspired by the great uh, stories that we have heard from Colombia, Uganda, other perspectives as well. My question here, it is uh, specifically since I am seeing here and I hope you can hear me uh, in the case of Uganda concretely. Um, what are the, I would say, the two biggest uh, challenges that we are seeing from a consumer information perspective to promote a circular economy approach in, 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 in Uganda? I lived for many years in, uh, in Kenya and um, actually I've spent uh, almost 10 years living in Kenya and I have seen uh, that uh, the uh, adoption of, uh, I would say, uh, that nothing is wasted, that there is in the, in, the, in the general population this approach and this mentality that we have to use, reuse, recycle, reduce waste. And, um, but only recently governments have started to talk about circular economy policies. So the society has this approach uh, and, and the government comes in with circular economy approaches. How do you reconcile both? How do you work uh, at the policy level, but also how do you use the traditional, I would say, mentality of the people that have this uh, very much ingrained in the society that is we reuse and use everything. So uh, would be would be interesting to hear your thoughts. Perfect. Are there any other questions? Yes, please. And introduce yourself, if you would. Thank you. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Andrea Vistendal, and I'm a, a lecturer at uh, Mela Dalens University, uh, Information Design. So in the sense of information, I was just wondering if the panel had some thoughts on education and how that can support uh, the, the progress in this matter. Thank you. Excellent question. And all the way through, of course, I mean, if you look at business education, know. you know, in, yeah, and... Do you have a view on what it should look like, well, actually? I'd love to hear just that. Just a few words. Uh, I think that from design, arts and culture, we can have, we have, a have a lot to contribute in this matter of how to visualise, how to imagine, how to put into the minds uh, images or thoughts or uh, initiatives that could matter to, to change the mentality and our, our rituals and our behavior basically so these are my thoughts and we c we're trying to work on this uh, at the university but also I am looking for more change and more governance uh, to support that it actually happens in the implementation in education so it's an excellent point thank you do you want to um, yeah please uh, I am Dr Lynn Wilson University of Glasgow and we uh, focus on consumer behavior um, but I also come from a circular design background and I just wonder how much uh, research, consumer research at an academic level in both quantitative but also qualitative research supports the work that your organisations do and that the policies that you develop. I'm particularly interested in the qualitative because we hear a lot about data mm -hmm. and a lot about surveys and a lot about um, attitude behaviour. So consumers will tell you one thing in a survey, but unless you really know what they're doing, unless you can see what they're doing, you can't really understand how to support them to change. And, and one thing we work on at Glasgow is putting the consumer at the centre of the circular economy. And at the moment, consumers don't really get that connection between why would you return something? Why would you, who's gonna benefit from that? Is that gonna make my product less? Am I gonna pay less for that product? And until we get that connection right between where is the role of the consumer in a circular economy? It's not for the consumer. The consumer is the circular economy. Until we get that right, it's gonna be a real challenge. And, uh, and yeah, back to my, my key question is, qualitative, quantitative research, how does it support the development of your work and policies? Thank you. Thank you very That's much. That's an excellent question. Yeah, as consumer advocates, we're always, you know, make sure the information, it's all about information at a consumer. That That's not going to work. This is all about with and understanding the sort of, you know, what would this look like if you had, if you were surrounded by a doctor, a lawyer, you know, the, the better angels of our nature, help us build with that in mind. Do we know if we have any questions from the audience? How we do that, I do not know, so bear with me. 
there may be folks online. If so, somebody, Becca, maybe you can raise your hand and you let me know. Perfect. All right, so back to our panel. Um, we've had excellent questions about what's the biggest challenge in Uganda, but perhaps in other situations as well, um, to promote a circular approach, um, getting policy to work for you, leveraging, working with traditional approaches to consumption. Um, the way in which education at all levels should be built, it can and should be built into this, right? It's not just about information, but um, our, our understanding of why that information is important and what to look for and a whole range of different things and how we then act as business leaders later on, for example, as marketers. Um, and how do we learn about the consumer? Um, how do we make sure we work with and engaging the consumer on the basis of um, not just the stats, but a deep understanding of how people are in the marketplace? Um, and we'll see if there are any questions. No other questions? OK. And then I would love um, for those who haven't commented on the sort of five areas um, that we've highlighted, if you have a strong preference that you haven't heard raised so far, um, please please mention that. So perhaps, Yu Kyung, could I come to you first? Um, would you like to react to on the education point and also how do, how do you learn about what consumers care about? Um, yes, thank you. So I was, um, how do we learn? So as consumer advocates, we want to, of course, understand, have a deep understanding of um, what consumer, what drives consumer behavior, what drives their understanding, and such, but um, at, we also we 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 feel that we need more. Um, as as a commentator mentioned, we need more research on the quantitative qualitative um, attitude of the consumers. So so one of the um, things that we see on the ground in Korea is this these types of sustainability um, drives that the government has been doing. For example, um, just like piecemeal approaches. For example. Um, banning plastic cups from coffee shops or banning plastic packaging at supermarkets caused a huge um, actually inconvenience to the consumers and the consumers um, there was a lot of complaints like why are you doing this this is like too difficult for us this is it's making our lives more um, more um, difficult so so the approaches that we we would like to see um, is it's just not some piecemeal, government driven or international some organization or organization driven approach but something that has a better understanding of consumer behavior and how to change it and and one of the um, things that also it, it also um, it involves um, so so one of the success successful programs that we see in Korea is um, supermarket aisles um, stock, um, eco-friendly products in one aisle. So if you want like organic celery, organic vegetables, you can go to a certain corner in the supermarket and you can just grab an item without um, thinking too much about the, the, um, the information or the, um, um, the, the nature of the product. But um, what we wanna see that type of um, um, nudging techniques, I would say uh, on the online, um, equivalent of, of these products. So, so for example, like if, uh, if we're going to buy like vegetables on an e-commerce app, we want to see that type of um, an algorithms like showing up more um, sustainable products and, and that would change. Um, it would be easier for the consumers to actually act on um, the, these um, more sustainable products, just, just not like having like information overload, but they, it would be more simple for the consumers to actually act on the certain types of information that they get. And Yu Kyung, how are people educated about consumer information, about how to watch out for greenwashing, um, about consumer rights in general in Korea? Well, we have, as consumer organizations, we have consumer um, advocacy campaigns, education programs. We have grassroots programs that reach out to um, local, we have local offices and branches and we have um, we reach out to the, the, the shoppers and the, the, the housewives who basically do the grocery shopping. And we also have consumer um, colleges. We call it consumer colleges. So we have like, like short-term 
consumer education programs where we invite um, specialists fr from every sector and we provide that program to the local um, citizens. Oh, so we could, um, yeah. Sorry, carry on. Oh, so we can, but we, we're trying to find the more like, um, I guess we would, as a consumer organization, we would have to develop that type of a program um, but we have to understand for ourselves, like what does sustainability mean and how are we going to um, teach them to the consumers? How are we going to inform them if we don't have a solid understanding ourselves? Great point. Thank you. Paul, can I come to you next? You had a specific question about uh, challenges to promoting circularity in the country. I'd love to hear um, if you have any thoughts on the, the sort of the way in which people are um, exposed to uh, education about consumer information as well. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And that's a very interesting question. Yes, of course, as uh, you might be aware, circular economy is a new concept, especially on this part of the world. Um, and of course, uh, 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 government, working government is, is, is coming up with the policies and measures to see how that can be uh, promoted. Uh, of course, uh, challenges, uh, uh, one of the challenges is that, uh, um, of course, having our society adopting these new policies and new concepts, it takes time. And it requires actually toning down these seemingly uh, difficult concepts into a layman's understanding. I'm happy to note that, uh, of course, there's now a shift because uh, our society is now experiencing actually uh, environmental changes, seasons. Of course, knowing that uh, our economy is based on, on agriculture, and we have seasons that we know that maybe during this uh, rain-fed rain -fed agriculture. Now, looking at the, the seasonality, have now changed. And of course, when you go to the masses and you explain this is due to um, environmental changes. And of course, we have a lot to pray as, a, as, a, as, 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 as consumers. Uh, the other issues that have also, we also have challenges with the uh, 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 plastic, plastic waste, plastic bottles, waste. Most of our drainage systems have been damaged because of uh, influx of this uh, plastic waste on in, in, in environment. Now, when we explain that uh, the sexual economy actually one, one of the one of the objectives is, is actually to limit waste, and if we if if, if we if we adopt these concepts and be able to practice them, this will make our world a better place to be. Um, the other the other avenue that we are doing as a, as 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 as, as, as adequate as for for consumer information is that we are working with the government has come up with a. One in the national development plan, one of the drivers of economy is the agro industrialization because most of the waste that we have in our country here actually is from the uh, food waste, the limited value addition. Now, all this, when uh, well explained to the masses and the indicate that, yes, when you do this, this is, these are the benefits. So the so-called obstacles, of course, uh, in terms of behavioral changes, people have now come to appreciate that actually this, 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 this global movement is there to make our life better. So that's what I can say, uh, uh, specifically on that. Maybe on the, on, 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 on the side of education, yes, education is key, is important, because when you empower somebody with the knowledge, they're able to take from decisions. What we have done from our side, like uh, with academia, the, the LC network has worked with the academia in Uganda, and uh, we have had uh, uh, an opportunity to introduce the LC concepts to the academia. Because th these are new on, on our side. I, I know a lot of work has been done elsewhere, but when it comes to our region in particular, uh, people are still grappling with, with these concepts. So we have worked with them. We have also had uh, uh, with work, working working with secondary schools. Uh, discussing about environmental topics in terms of uh, we have had uh, uh, environmental quiz where 
we encourage students, we set a number of questions that, that, that promotes the environment. And at the, at, the, at, the, at the end of the day, the winner takes the award. And of course, this we've seen it also with the with the with the with the ASO. ASO has also been doing this as well, promoting its sustainability, sustainability scheme. So I believe I, that education is important, and of course, we have to, to leverage on the on, on that to ensure that we, we we empower our masses. Thank you very much. Thank you. This reminds me that um, as Consumers International, we recently looked at the state of uh, consumer protection and empowerment across 80 countries. And we looked at information and education as part of that across all of the, the things we looked at. Um, really, we, you know, we get at best a sort of a D plus or a C is 53 out of a possible 100 information and education was slightly better than the average and strangely enough but I think that's because we haven't quite realized how much we need to get across to people right now but it's an, it, it reminded me of this actually Louise I'd love to come to you on this question about how do you learn about the consumer how do you really embed yourself with the individual who's going through all of this change how do you use different types of um, understanding not just quantitative surveys and go beyond to stand in the consumer's shoes yes indeed thank you helena i was actually making a note on, on my own on exactly that subject because we yeah indeed we have we have done a lot of research as as many companies have at the moment around you know sustainability and consumers take on sustainability and what we've found a lot is in in most of the research we see that consumers make statements that yes sustainability is an important factor it matters to me i would make a sustainable choice when confronted with the option. However, what we have identified in some of the, so, so that is really in the research, but what we have identified in some of the pilots that we've been running, so the live pi pilot, when we confront the consumer uh, in their actual consumer decision journey, we see often that they actually do quite the opposite. So what they say in a survey is one thing and what they do in actual life in a part of their consumer decision journey is something else. Uh, so we thought about, you know, why can that be? Why do we have the mass of the consumers making statements that they are willing to make a sustainable choice if provided with the information? And then what we identify in live pilots in real settings is, is, is not the same. So we've took that, uh, or the solution for us was to then figure out, okay, how can we create strong and convincing and credible claims that then can enable a shift in consumer behavior also in the journey that they are at. Uh, so not only what they think they should say, but actually what they're doing as a part of their standard journey. Uh, so that is something that we are playing around with now to find the right direction for the claims, maintain the credibility according to the principle that's defined by the, by the One Planet Network Group, but, but, but still create something that goes beyond just information, something that really has the power to change consumer decision uh, towards a more sustainable choice. Yeah, this is a great point. I mean, it's, it has to be specific to context. And then it's just a vast difference between what you intend when you're confronted with a survey and how you'll respond to that, to the messiness and the craziness of your life where you have to make a split you know second decision on a product you may you know not know very much about and being expected okay. to look at a qr code and download stuff it's just not going to happen so it's almost no. that sort of complete surround sound of how we build for and with the consumer that has to shift um and yeah. why this is much more than information yeah yeah, and it's also about defining the right message for the right part of the consumer decision journey. It's very much what marketeers are doing all the time in any message that they are kind of trying to get across to consumers, yeah. finding the right way to talk to consumers, you know, depending on where they are in their journey. And then also finding the right message for all the different type of consumer groups that we have out there, because there is a lot of different in terms of the knowledge from consumers, where they are in their sort of sustainability transformation and then getting that cross that message directly pointed to a certain consumer at a certain time of their journey that's that's quite some work picking up the education point again do you think the marketers of today get that and are being trained along those lines to help no so actually that was another point that i also had written down that i think when we talk about how can we reach businesses uh, to get this information across to the businesses, to the ones that are connecting with consumers. I think there we need to think about how can we get beyond group sustainability or the dedicated people uh, within this field 
with the same information, with the same message and, 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 and knowledge within the marketing teams, with sales teams, with the planning department, because that's really where messaging towards consumers is being created. And I think in general, the knowledge is more limited within those those uh, those functions in a company. So I think that is where we need to work on to try to get these manuscripts and to get these guidelines to the right stakeholders within the companies that has the power to make a change uh, in how we communicate towards consumers. Brilliant. And if I can just one last question to you, Louise, as you looked, because we didn't ask you at the start, um, of the five different areas, which one do you feel most passionate about in our in our mini mini manifesto? Yeah, well, I have a I have a background in consumer marketing, uh, so of course the, the I mean the whole setup on on information sharing, creating communications uh, for the good, you know, using the force of marketing to actually cut through the clutter and to explain complex data, difficult statements, which it is when you talk about sustainability, it's not obvious for the random consumer. How can you make sense of that by using the power of marketing, still maintaining the credibility, uh, substantiation of the claims, but how can you use the force of marketing for good to make sure that you can get that message across and really drive a shift in consumer behavior? And I'm talking about the shift, which is not necessarily only for the already dedicated followers of sustainability, but actually for the greater mass, for the people that actually don't, they think it is important, but they're not that dedicated. How can you really create messaging and, and, and stories that can shift them over towards a more sustainable choice? Yeah, wouldn't it be great if the next COPs actually incorporated this sort of how people are in the marketplace? We, it's so sectoral. You know, we, we're yeah. thrilled that, you know, we managed to insert food into the COP conversation, but there isn't anything really about people in the marketplace and, and consumers and this demand side of the equation. Um, yeah. So very much so. Before handing back to Ulf to try and summarize and what we're going to do next, I'd love to hear, I didn't ask Rigit and I didn't ask Yu Kyung which of the five areas of the uh, manifesto that we highlighted you would like, uh, you think are, are most important in the next two years and why. Um, could, would you uh, take a shot at that? Rigit, perhaps take a, a go first. Sure, thanks. Good to be back on the panel. Um, I think uh, I think from our experience here in India in this part of the world, uh, it's very difficult to answer this question because I think the uh, the question has to be perhaps reframed. Um, all the steps are important. Uh, all the steps and all the actors are important, not just for driving uh, you know, transformation towards sustainable living, but also ensuring that this is maintained. And I'll give you an example. Um, what is more important uh, to us is how do you sort of arrange these steps or the drivers or the custodians of the steps into, into a cogent manner so that uh, the, the, the impact is, uh, uh, you know, is reinforced in terms of long-term transformation in sustainable living. Um, and in, in our view, uh, based on the experience that we have, not just in one, but at least two or three instances in India, we, we see uh, um, very much that there is this, this logic where, you know, the government really, it all starts with the government, with the, you know, the supportive policies, the incentives, and, and really a long-term vision uh, on, on a particular uh, transformation. And then uh, businesses sort of, uh, response to that, and and uh, you know they they see that there is long term benefit in that transition, providing that kind of service and 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 or goods, and then eventually the consumers sort of rally. And the example that uh, two examples, one is of the you know the electric vehicle hybrid vehicles uh, uh, market here in India, and over the last couple of years we've seen incredible amount of shift towards the electric vehicle, hybrid vehicle uh, sales, uh, if you look at the sales data. And it's, it's very interesting and also sort of uh, confusing because uh, electric vehicles are about, almost about double the price of uh, the, the normal vehicle. Um, um, and yet consumers are, are making that shift. So when you look at that, you know, there are definitely other factors which are helping or uh, supporting that transition. Uh, and that's why we feel that this sort of collaboration between 
government, business, and consumer sort of coming together as sort of you know uh, uh, you know ensuring that there is some sort of a symphony there uh, in how they sort of engage is critical, and it is very difficult to say well you know we pick this and not the other. Um, and the same example, I mean the same experience also in this uh, star rating of uh, uh, of uh, electric uh, appliances that was run again by the government, uh, you know, uh, backed by a law uh, implemented by a government agency, the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. And it, it was made mandatory, of course, for some, some uh, equipments. And, you know, the businesses sort of, uh, 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 you know, sprung into action. Consumers have been using that star. So it, it is very difficult to identify one step. I think what is more important is how do we arrange these three, you know, actors in this, uh, in this, on, on this issue together in order to ensure that the, 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 the transformation in sustainable living is, uh, is, 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 is not only driven, but also it is maintained over a long term period. Thanks for, thanks for this is a very, of course, you know, me asking which one is the most important is is false. You're you're absolutely right. If I could ask you, sort of, so if we were to look at something for say COP twenty seven, where would you try and bring all of these five together? Is there a particular sector or a particular change that you think uh, this group could uh, lean into? Uh, sure. I mean, it depends on who whose reality counts or whose interest are, is it that we are looking at. Uh, if it is the you know the the southern consumer, for example, which you know is part of part of the, the the world that I represent here, I think it is important to look at those consumer facing sectors. You know, uh, the usual uh, apparel and textile, uh, food and agriculture, ICT. There are incredible opportunities, and I think. You know, going back to one of the points that was, uh, you know, was raised earlier about this whole issue of circular economy. Paul, circular economy is nothing new. It's a, it's old wine in new bottle, really. You know, uh, we've had long traditions, as uh, Jorge was saying uh, about, um, about, you know, living our lives in a particular way, uh, and just the government regulation probably reinforces. Uh, the fact that we can actually go back to that old style of living. So perhaps the government, uh, Helena, uh, should be targeted to highlight. You know, how do you, how do you, how do you create and reinforce that confidence in 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 consumers that you know it's 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 great to go back to old style of living, and it actually is uh, going to uh, you know ensure longevity of the planet and, and society. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much. I think we have four, only even three minutes left. So I just want to first check that questions have been answered satisfactorily in the audience. Oh, we've got we've got a yes and a sort of shake of it. So for, to be continued, perhaps, given we've got three minutes here. But I know the panelists are super uh, fantastic at engaging, so we can keep going there. Um, so Ulf, I think we heard we're in a bit of a mess per consumer information, despite the guidelines. We need more of really sort of action on the guidelines. We know that of the five areas, um, these are all complementary and important and will enable us to harmonize and simplify and get clarity to move forward. Um, we've had fantastic conversations and, uh, and questions beyond that about, but how are we learning about the consumers that we're informing? Um, and how are we learning how to inform them and actually evolving even the practice practice of marketing, uh, but it's a hopeful group. So can you summarize what we need to do next, Dolph? Yeah, thank you for giving me that task, uh, Elena. My pleasure, <laughs> oh. That's a pretty easy one. Um, no, um, th thanks to all the panelists. Uh, you, you did a very great job, and, and, and thanks to the audience here. So uh, it was a very rich discussion, and it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a bit hard to summarize, but uh, I think some of the things are, are quite uh, clear in, in, in front of us. I think um, the th there was an overall... Uh, understanding that there are policies urgently needed to fight greenwashing. There's too much greenwashing on the market. And uh, of course, we can't do as a program the policies for uh, against greenwashing, but we can uh, help in defining what is greenwashing and what can be done. Uh, 
the, the guidelines are, uh, I would say, a good guidance for that, but uh, we may have to go beyond that to make it a little bit more, even more concrete. Mm -hmm. So to, to define con very concretely and, and also, I would say, regulation uh, fitting uh, what, uh, what is greenwashing, so to have a sort of level playing field, which uh, uh, rightly was, was addressed and it, it's absolutely needed. Um, the second thing um, is education. Yes, of course, R raising awareness and raising awareness from from the beginning. Um, best practice uh, we could identify in some curricula in, in, in some countries. Maybe we can scale that up or at least spread the news. And uh, of course, we have to uh, to ensure their consistency in the in the policy so that this education and awareness raising is also taking into account what the guidelines are and, and so on. So, so these kind of things and we have to, uh, with our program, uh, work together with the uh, Sustainable Lifestyles and Education program because it's uh, uh, also their, their issue. Uh, E-commerce can, can be an opportunity yeah, but it's also a, a, a risk. I mean, the, um, that's that's for sure. And there are technical barriers. I know it from projects at home um, that there are technical uh, barriers on just uh, tra transferring the information from from the uh, from from the first step in the uh, supply chain to the uh, to the consumers. Maybe the digital product passport. Which is uh, now, uh, or which will now be developed, in particular in on the European level, um, may help in, in in that regard. But uh, uh, still, the uh, credibility of the information put into that uh, digital product <laughs> passport is also very important. And uh, I think that uh, has to be looked at uh, also from from our side. Um, Informing consumers on the impact of their consumption and show how they can do better. This is something uh, we are already doing. Maybe we can do it a little bit more enhanced using, for example, greenhouse gas calculators as we do it at home, which is very much accepted uh, um, and to raise awareness and show where are the big issues. Where are the big issues for biodiversity? Where are the big huge issues in, in terms of climate change in the consumption uh, patterns of each and everybody? So, so to make it easier to them uh, to, to, to do better and to reduce their, their climate impact, for example. Um, increased international collaboration, yes. Um, <coughs> Thank you very much, Anna, for, for mentioning our, our project. We, we are very much looking forward to, to that project and support uh, the, the regional approach on the eco-label there in, in Latin America. Th this is, uh, I mean, UNEP is uh, supporting that, the European Commission is supporting that, and we want to support that as, as well, also with the collaboration, but also with, of course, taking the regional preferences uh, uh, into into account and uh, yes or no, of course, uh, um, support the development of the uh, most ambitious types of eco-label, the type one eco-labeling, uh, which is uh, represented by the global eco-labeling network and um, um, <coughs> collaborate and uh, work together with with Jen also in, in that uh, in that regard. And uh, yes, I think regional initiatives are very important. Uh, also global, but on a global level, on a regional level, you have the same same market quite often. And this is the same uh, uh, language in, in terms of uh, Latin America with the uh, consumers and the same understanding and the same level of development quite often. We see that in Southeast Asia as well. Uh, so we, we uh, uh, try to also uh, support these uh, these regional um, initiatives. Um, the development of a database. So, uh, what, wh where does the information come from, and uh, what is the source of the information? And it is a reliable source, and all kinds of things. And uh, this this is this is also uh, quite uh, quite important and. Uh, could be worked uh, on and uh, yes and ha <laughs> how to get the message across this marketing thing yes we haven't looked into that so far but uh, we we might 
might do that in, in in the future. So these are a lot of things, a lot of tasks. I don't know if we will all <laughs> make <laughs> we will uh, addre can address them all. Uh, it's a, it's a program. It's not uh, an agency or something like that. So, but uh, we will do our best. Thank you very much, and I give back floor to Helena. Well, with that, um, it's my great pleasure to thank our wonderful panelists who've joined from all uh, parts of across the world. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you very, very much indeed. Really enjoyed your interventions and your responding to questions and the hybrid interventions that we've had here from the room and, and back. But um, uh, hopefully we've uh, started a conversation that will continue. Thank you so much for those of you uh, in the room uh, for listening, thinking about this particular question, posing uh, great uh, ideas. And we hope we get to work with you uh, in the next two years and beyond. Thank you and have a great rest of Stockholm Plus 50. Bye bye.